so after I heard God's voice and whatever, and I went to Korea, I started going to church again, but it was a very slow, gradual journey of coming back into a relationship with him. There's been a huge shift for me over the last seven years, partly starting the company and then partly also going to this new church. It's called Solomon's Porch. But the one thing that this church does is they fast for the first 21 days of every year. You're supposed to pray and listen to God and see what he tells you to fast from. And in general, you should fast from something that's hard to give up. Because when you give up something that's hard to give up, you're basically saying, God, you're more important than this thing that I really value. That's how important you are. And with that space that you create by giving up that thing, you can feel the presence of God, the hunger to have more of God's presence. So our church started in Hong Kong, I think it's like 15, 20 years ago now. When they first started fasting, people thought they were crazy. Like, what? This is so unhealthy. And also recently, there's been all this research coming out about how fasting is very healthy for you. So anyways, the first fast, I was sitting there and trying to figure out what I should fast from. And kind of like the default quote unquote, at, at the church is most people don't eat for 21 days, but then they'll do lo- like some sort of liquid diet. They'll have some soups or some juices, that sort of thing. Like pregnant women might fast from social media. The hardest core thing that I heard about was one of our church members in Hong Kong actually fasted for 40 days, no food, no juice, no soup, just water for 40 days. That's the craziest thing I've ever heard in my life. So anyways, I'm sitting here and I'm trying to figure out what to fast from. And I, I don't really value food, to be honest. I think it comes from, again, that desire to be accepted and all that stuff. Like it drove me to be very goal oriented. And that leads to this mindset of deferring pleasure to get more pleasure later. And so I have much more of like an investment for later mindset rather than having pleasure now sort of mindset. And so for me, food is kind of a source of calories. My college roommates used to laugh at me because they would find remnants of like a hamburger on the toilet seat because I've been sitting there taking a poo and eating at the same time because it was just a waste of time to go sit down and eat. I used to wrestle as well in high school. And so we would not eat and exercise very, very intensely to drop weight to make our weight class. So I thought to myself, okay, I should probably not eat, but I don't know if I'm going to feel that in the same way as other people. And so what else can I fast from? What would be the most difficult thing for me to fast from? And I sat there, I prayed about it. I thought about it. You know, I went on a walk in our neighborhood. And I remember sort of like looking up and it kind of just dawned on me, actually, the hardest thing for me to give up is work. And again, it's tied into that fact that I got bullied and I want to prove myself and be accepted and affirmed. And that's how it manifests these days. So I ran back in the house and I ran upstairs and I burst into the room and I said, Elaine, Elaine, this is my wife. I know what I need to fast from. I need to fast from work. And she just looks at me with this quizzical look. She loves food, by the way. She's much more of a pleasure sort of oriented person. She just looks at me and she's like, that's not a fast. That's called a vacation. <laughs> so I ended up doing this. I couldn't fast the whole day, but I ended up taking the whole morning off and into the afternoon. And I go to McRitchie Reservoir here in Singapore. And I just like hang out with God. And, and I felt like I needed to tell Ramanan, my business partner, this. And so and we had this thing where we had done a lot of small deals together. And then we had this thing that was 18 times larger than our largest deal that, that fell apart around like November-ish. In December, we're like reeling from that. And we started to get going on this other deal, which is also 18 times as big as that, you know, as anything we'd ever done. Same size, if anything, like even more coveted, the sort of like co-investors that were involved and the, the scale of the entrepreneur and so forth. And so here we're in this like very, very critical moment in our firm's development and then I just told my partners, like, hey, I'm going to stop working for half the day. And he's like, what? And, and, and I'm going to stop eating. He's like, what are you talking about? This makes absolutely no sense. You're not going to have any energy. So like the, the time that you are working, you're going to be completely unproductive. And you're not going to be working for much time. Like, this is so crucial that we had this thing fall apart just now. And then how, how are you going to do this in this moment? And I said, well, look, I acknowledge that you believe something very different from what I believe. But in terms of what I believe, you know, if you look at the scriptures in the Old Testament, the, the, the Israelites, they didn't fast when it was convenient. They fasted when they're about to go into battle, right? Because that's when it's important to demonstrate that it's really not their own strength, but God's strength. It's God's strength that brings them the victory. So if anything, like this is our battle, man. This is, we're, we're about to go into battle and this is the most crucial time. And we should be bulking up and eating big fat steak dinners to get ourselves ready for battle. But I think I'm going to fast from work. And he's like, well, and he just he couldn't understand it. And we went back and forth and he resisted very, very fiercely. But eventually he saw I wasn't going to give in. So he kind of just said, okay, fine. I don't understand it. I don't agree with it, but shoot. Well, okay. I respect that we have a difference of opinion and, and you can do that. Your company, if it didn't work out this deal, it could fall. The whole thing could have been over. Yeah, we were, we were reeling at that point. And yeah, you need to start doing some bigger deals for, for things to make sense economically. We've been investing into the business for a while. So it's existential threat. So I go forth and I fast. I mean, this is one of those stories like where for that 21 days, I would go and then I would hang out with God. 
But at the beginning, to be honest, I tried to do 15 minutes, maybe 30 minutes a day of quiet time sort of thing, like maybe an hour if I was like really, really free or something, but sit there for like four or five hours a day was totally mind blowing for me. And I went and so I'd sit there for an hour and kind of be like, okay, and sing some songs and then read the Bible, pray a bit and whatever. And then like at the end of an hour, you kind of like start losing steam. And you know, by that hour and a half mark, I'm starting to twiddle my thumbs, look around two hours, like, oh man, I'm really bored. What am I supposed to do here? It's kind of like I had this father who I was basically estranged from, who was my dad, but we had never really spent long chunks of time together. It just wasn't natural. It felt all of a sudden like really awkward. Like he was almost my stepdad or something. I'd have him for little bits of time here and there, but that's not really what a father-son relationship is, is all about. So anyways, it was very awkward at first, but by the end of the 21 days, I talked about the pictures and visions and things and like just started to get much more clear communication and words and just to understand his heart really more than anything else and how much he loves me. And another thing is I feel a lot more comfortable talking about my faith now than before, because I used to think Christianity was this divisive thing. Like, oh, I'm Christian, you're not. But actually you realize when you understand the heart of the father, he talked to a lot of people who aren't Christians or who weren't Israelites or whatever. And I think the heart of God is like, he, we're all his children. He loves all of us. Of course, he wants relationship with all of us. So if you don't have relationship, then yes, he wants to bring you into that. So if that means coming to church. Yeah, all well, that's fantastic. But I don't think my job is to convert anybody. So I used to think, oh, if I'm trying to convert somebody, it's awkward if I talk about Jesus or not or whatever. But for me, I'm just trying to show God's love. And I think if they see that, they're attracted to God's love. And it's God's role to show them what they should do. All I need to do is, is just sacrifice myself, honor people, show them love, and then God does the rest. For a season, every day I take an Uber or Grab. Every single Uber dri or Grab driver that I took I would pray for them. Muslims, Buddhists, agnostics, atheists, there are only like two out of probably thousands, I think, that said, no, I don't want you to pray for me. When you just have that attitude of like, hey, I just want to bless you. It's okay if you don't believe what I believe, but I feel like the, the God I believe in loves you. It doesn't matter what you believe. And so I just want to bless you with that. And who doesn't want to get blessed? So we got that deal done. From this point, Ramadan, he'll sit there and every now and then I pull something crazy, like I need to fast. At one point I was like, hey, I need to go work one day a week from the church office or like crazy things. And I'm not doing that anymore, but at each point he'd resist and I'd say like, God told me to do it eventually. And he'd be like, eh, it's okay. Look, well, it seems to be working. So I guess I'm fine. Just go for it. <laughs> so at this point he doesn't really question too much if I say God told me to do it. <laughs>